introduction to the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr published 1905 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry dedication and introduction dedication to the memory of the scotch-irish leader of the south my uncle colonel leroy mcafee grand titan of the invisible empire ku klux klan introduction to the reader the klansman is the second book in a series of historical novels planned on the race conflict the leopard's spots was the statement in historical outline of the conditions from the enfranchisement of the negro to his disenfranchisement the klansman develops the true story of the ku klux klan conspiracy which overturned the reconstruction regime the organization was governed by the grand wizard commander-in-chief who lived in memphis tennessee the grand dragon commanded a state the grand titan a congressional district the grand giant a county and the grand cyclops a township den the twelve volumes of government reports on the famous clan refer chiefly to events which occurred after eighteen seventy the date of its dissolution the chaos of blind passion that followed lincoln's assassination is inconceivable today the revolution it produced in our government and the bold attempt of thaddeus stevens to africanize ten great states of the american union read now like tales from the arabian nights i have sought to preserve in this romance both the letter and the spirit of this remarkable period the men who enact the drama of fierce revenge into which i have woven a double love story are historical figures i have merely changed their names without taking a liberty with any essential historic fact in the darkest hour of the life of the south when her wounded people lay helpless amid rags and ashes under the beak and talon of the vulture suddenly from the mist of the mountains appeared a white cloud the size of a man's hand it grew until its mantle of mystery enfolded the stricken earth and sky an invisible empire had risen from the field of death and challenged the visible to mortal combat how the young south led by the reincarnated souls of the clansmen of old scotland went forth under this cover and against overwhelming odds daring exile imprisonment and a felon's death and saved the life of a people forms one of the most dramatic chapters in the history of the aryan race thomas dixon jr dixondale virginia december fourteenth nineteen o four end of dedication and introduction book one chapter one of the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, recorded by Michelle Fry. Book One, The Assassination, Chapter One, The Bruised Reed. The fair girl who was playing a banjo and singing to the wounded soldiers suddenly stopped, and turning to the surgeon, whispered, "What's that? It sounds like a mob." with a common impulse they moved to the open window of the hospital and listened on the soft spring air came the roar of excited thousands sweeping down the avenue from the capitol toward the white house above all rang the cries of struggling newsboys screaming an extra one of them darted around the corner his shrill voice quivering with excitement extra extra peace victory windows were suddenly raised women thrust their heads out and others rushed into the street and crowded around the boy struggling to get his papers he threw them right and left and snatched the money no one asked for change without ceasing rose his cry extra peace victory lee has surrendered 
at last the end had come the great north with its millions of sturdy people and their exhaustless resources had greeted the first shot on sumter with contempt and incredulity a few regiments went forward for a month's outing to settle the trouble the thirteenth brooklyn marched gaily southward on a thirty days jaunt with pieces of rope conspicuously tied to their muskets with which to bring back each man a southern prisoner to be led in a noose through the streets on their early triumphant return it would be unkind to tell what became of those ropes when they suddenly started back home ahead of the scheduled time from the first battle of bull run people from the south equally wise marched gaily north to whip five yankees each before breakfast and encountered unforeseen difficulties both sides had things to learn and learn them in a school whose logic is final a four years course in the university of hell the scream of eagles the howl of wolves the bay of tigers the roar of lions all locked in death's embrace and each mad scene lit by the glare of volcanoes of savage passions but the long agony was over the city bells began to ring the guns of the forts joined the chorus and their deep steel throats roared until the earth trembled just across the street a mother who was reading the fateful news turned and suddenly clasped a boy to her heart crying for joy the last draft of half a million had called for him the capital of the nation was shaking off the long nightmare of horror and suspense more than once the city had shivered at the mercy of those daring men in gray and the reveille of their drums had startled even the president at his desk again and again had the destiny of the republic hung on the turning of a hair and in every crisis luck fate god had tipped the scale for the union a procession of more than five hundred confederate deserters who had crossed the lines in groups swung into view marching past the hospital indifferent to the tumult only a nominal guard flanked them as they shuffled along tired ragged and dirty the gray in their uniforms was now the color of clay some had on blue pantaloons some blue vests others blue coats captured on the field of blood some had pieces of carpet and others old bags around their shoulders they had been passing thus for weeks nobody paid any attention to them one of the secrets of the surrender exclaimed dr barnes mr lincoln has been at the front for the past weeks with offers of peace and mercy if they would lay down their arms the great soul of the president even the genius of lee could not resist his smile began to melt those gray ranks as the sun is warming the earth today you are a great admirer of the president said the girl with a curious smile yes miss elsie and so are all who know him she turned from the window without reply a shadow crossed her face as she looked past the long row of cots on which rested the men in blue until her eyes found one on which lay alone among his enemies a young confederate officer the surgeon turned with her toward the man will he live she asked yes only to be hung for what she cried sentenced by court-martial as a guerrilla it's a lie but there's some powerful hand back of it some mysterious influence in high authority the boy wasn't fully conscious at the trial we must appeal to mr stanton as well appeal to the devil they say the order came from his office a boy of nineteen she exclaimed it's a shame i'm looking for his mother you told me to telegraph to richmond for her yes i'll never forget his cries that night so utterly pitiful and childlike i've heard many a cry of pain but in all my life nothing so heartbreaking as that boy in fevered delirium talking to his mother his voice is one of peculiar tenderness penetrating and musical it goes quivering into your soul and compels you to listen until you swear it's your brother or sweetheart or sister or mother calling you you should have seen him the day he fell god of mercies the pity and the glory of it 
phil wrote me that he was a hero and asked me to look after him were you there yes with the battery your brother was supporting he was the colonel of a shattered rebel regiment lying just in front of us before petersburg richmond was doomed resistance was madness but there they were ragged and half starved a handful of men not more than four hundred but their bayonets gleamed and flashed in the sunlight in the face of a murderous fire he charged and actually drove our men out of an entrenchment we concentrated our guns on him as he crouched behind this earthwork our own men lay outside in scores dead dying and wounded when the fire slacked we could hear their cries for water suddenly this boy sprang on the breastwork he was dressed in a new gray colonel's uniform that his mother of his in the pride of her soul had sent him he was a handsome figure tall slender straight a gorgeous yellow sash tasseled with gold around his waist his sword flashing in the sun his slouch hat cocked on one side and an eagle's feather in it we thought he was going to lead another charge but just as the battery was making ready to fire he deliberately walked down the embankment in a hail of musketry and began to give water to our wounded men every gun ceased firing and we watched him he walked back to the trench his naked sword flashed suddenly above that eagle's feather and his grizzled ragamuffins sprang forward and charged us like so many demons there were not more than three hundred of them now but on they came giving that hellish rebel yell at every jump the cry of the hunter from the hilltop at the sight of his game all southern men are hunters and that cry was transformed in war into something unearthly when it came from a hundred throats in chorus and the game was human of course it was madness we blew them down that hill like chaff before a hurricane when the last man had staggered back or fallen on came this boy alone carrying the colors he had snatched from a falling soldier as if he were leading a million men to victory a bullet had blown his hat from his head and we could see the blood streaming down the side of his face he charged straight into the jaws of one of our guns and then with a smile on his lips and a dare to death in his big brown eyes he rammed that flag into the cannon's mouth reeled and fell a cheer broke from our men your brother sprang forward and caught him in his arms and as we bent over the unconscious form he exclaimed my god doctor look at him he is so much like me i feel as if i had been shot myself they were as much alike as twins only his hair was darker i tell you miss elsie it's a sin to kill men like that one such man is worth more to this nation than every negro that ever set his flat foot on this continent the girl's eyes had grown dim as she listened to the story i will appeal to the president she said firmly it's the only chance and just now he is under tremendous pressure his friendly order to the virginia legislature to return to richmond stanton forced him to cancel the master hand has organized a conspiracy in congress to crush the president they curse his policy of mercy as imbecility and swear to make the south a second poland their watchwords are vengeance and confiscation four-fifths of his party in congress are in this plot the president has less than a dozen real friends in either house on whom he can depend they say that stanton is to be given a free hand and that the gallows will be busy this cancelled order of the president looks like it i'll try my hand with mr stanton she said with slow emphasis good luck little sister let me know if i can help the surgeon answered cheerily as he passed on his round of work elsie stoneman took her seat beside the cot of the wounded confederate and began softly to sing and play a little farther along the same row a soldier was dying a faint choking just audible in his throat an attendant sat beside him and would not leave till the last the ordinary chat and hum of the ward went on indifferent to peace victory life or death before the finality of the hospital all other events of earth fade some were playing cards or checkers some laughing and joking and others reading at the first soft note from the singer the games ceased and the reader put down his book 
the banjo had come to washington with the negroes following the wake of the army she had laid aside her guitar and learned to play all the stirring camp songs of the south her voice was low soothing and tender it held every silent listener in a spell as she played and sang the songs the wounded man loved her eyes lingered in pity on his sun-bronzed face pinched and drawn with fever he was sleeping the stupid sleep that gives no rest she could count the irregular pounding of his heart in the throb of the big vein on his neck his lips were dry and burnt and the little boyish moustache curled upward from the row of white teeth as if scorched by the fiery breath he began to talk in flighty sentences and she listened his mother his sister and yes she was sure as she bent nearer a little sweetheart who lived next door they all had sweethearts these southern boys again he was teasing his dog and then back in battle at length he opened his eyes great dark brown eyes unnaturally bright with a strange yearning look in their depths as they rested on elsie he tried to smile and feebly said here's here's a fly on my left ear my guns can't somehow reach him won't you she sprang forward and brushed the fly away again he opened his eyes excuse me for asking but am i alive yes indeed was the cheerful answer well now then is this me or is it not me or has the cannon shot me or has the devil got me it's you the cannon didn't shoot you but three muskets did and the devil hasn't got you yet but he will unless you're good i'll be good if you won't leave me elsie turned her head away smiling and he went on slowly but i'm dead i know i'm sleeping on a cot with a canopy over it i ain't hungry any more and an angel has been hovering over me playing on a harp of gold only a little yankee girl playing the banjo can't fool me i'm in heaven you're in the hospital funny hospital look at that harp and that big trumpet hanging close by it that's gabriel's trumpet no she laughed this is the patent office building that covers two blocks now a temporary hospital there are seventy thousand wounded soldiers in town and more coming on every train the thirty-five hospitals are overcrowded he closed his eyes a moment in silence and then spoke with a feeble tremor i'm afraid you don't know who i am i can't impose on you i'm a rebel yes i know you are colonel ben cameron it makes no difference to me now which side you fought on well i'm in heaven been dead a long time i can prove it if you'll play again what shall i play first oh johnny booker help dis nigger she played and sang it beautifully now wake up in the morning again he listened with wide staring eyes that saw nothing except visions within now then the old gray horse as the last notes died away he tried to smile again one more hard times and worse are coming with deft sure touch and soft negro dialect she sang it through now didn't i tell you that you couldn't fool me no yankee girl could play and sing these songs i'm in heaven and you're an angel aren't you ashamed of yourself to flirt with me with one foot in the grave that's the time to get on good terms with the angels but i'm done dead elsie laughed in spite of herself i know it he went on because you have shining golden hair and amber eyes instead of blue ones i never saw a girl in my life before with such eyes and hair but you're young yet never was such a girl on earth you're an she lifted her finger in warning and his eyelids drooped in exhausted stupor 
you mustn't talk any more she whispered shaking her head a commotion at the door caused elsie to turn from the cot a sweet motherly woman of fifty in an old faded black dress was pleading with the guard to be allowed to pass can't do it mum it's again the rules but i must go in i've tramped for four days through a wilderness of hospitals and i know he must be here special orders mum wounded rebels in here that belong in prison very well young man said the pleading voice my baby boy is in this place wounded and about to die i'm going in there you can shoot me if you like or you can turn your head the other way she stepped quickly past the soldier who merely stared with dim eyes out the door and saw nothing she stood for a moment with a look of helpless bewilderment the vast area of the second story of the great monolithic pile was crowded with rows of sick wounded and dying men a strange solemn and curious sight against the walls were ponderous glass cases filled with models of every kind of invention the genius of man had dreamed between these cases were deep lateral openings eight feet wide crowded with the sick and long rows of them were stretched through the center of the hall a gallery ran around above the cases and this was filled with cots the clatter of the feet of passing surgeons and nurses over the marble floor added to the weird impression elsie saw the look of the helpless appeal in the mother's face and hurried forward to meet her is this mrs cameron of south carolina the trembling figure in black grasped her hand eagerly yes yes my dear and i'm looking for my boy who is wounded unto death can you help me i thought i recognized you from a miniature i've seen she answered softly i'll lead you direct to his cot thank you thank you came the low reply in a moment she was beside him and elsie walked away to the open window through which came the chirp of sparrows from the lilac bushes in full bloom below the mother threw one look of infinite tenderness on the drawn face and her hands suddenly clasped in prayer i thank thee lord jesus for this hour thou hast heard the cry of my soul and led my feet she gently knelt kissed the hot lips smoothed the dark tangled hair back from his forehead and her hand rested over his eyes a faint flush tinged his face it's you mama i know you that's your hand or else it's god's she slipped her arms about him my hero my darling my baby i'll get well now mama never fear you see i had whipped them that day as i had many a time before i don't know how it happened my men seemed all to go down at once you know i couldn't surrender in that new uniform of a colonel you sent me we made a gallant fight and now I i'm just a little tired tired but you're here and it's all right yes yes dear it's all over now general lee has surrendered and when you are better i'll take you home where the sunshine and flowers will give you your strength again how's my little sis hunting in another part of the city for you she's grown so tall and stately you'll hardly know her your papa is at home and don't know yet that you're wounded and my sweetheart marion lenoir the most beautiful little girl in piedmont as sweet and mischievous as ever mr lenoir is very ill but he has written a glorious poem about one of your charges i'll show it to you tomorrow he is our greatest poet the south worships him marion sent her love to you and a kiss for the young hero of piedmont i'll give it to you now she bent again and kissed him and my dogs general sherman left them at least well i'm glad of that my mare's all right yes but we had a time to save her jake hid her in the woods till the army passed bully for jake i don't know what we should have done without him old alec still at home and getting drunk as usual no he ran away with the army and persuaded every negro on the lenoir place to go except his wife aunt cindy the old rascal 
when mrs lenoir's mother saved him from burning to death when he was a boy yes and he told the yankee those fire scars were made with the lash and led a squad to the house one night to burn the barns jake headed them off and told on him the soldiers were so mad they strung him up and thrashed him nearly to death we haven't seen him since well i'll take care of your mama when i get home of course i'll get well it's absurd to die at nineteen you know i never believed the bullet had been molded that could hit me in three years of battle i lived a charmed life and never got a scratch his voice had grown feeble and labored and his face flushed his mother placed her hand on his lips just one more he pleaded feebly did you see the little angel who has been playing and singing for me you must thank her yes i see her coming now i must go and tell margaret and we will get a pass and come every day she kissed him and went to see elsie and you are the dear girl who has been playing and singing for my boy a wounded stranger here alone among his foes yes and for all the others too mrs cameron seized both of her hands and looked at her tenderly you will let me kiss you i shall always love you she pressed elsie to her heart in spite of the girl's reserve a sob caught her breath at the touch of the warm lips her own mother had died when she was a baby and a shy hungry heart long hidden from the world leaped in tenderness and pain to meet that embrace elsie walked with her to the door wondering how the terrible truth of her boy's doom could be told she tried to speak looked into mrs cameron's face radiant with grateful joy and the words froze on her lips she decided to walk a little way with her but the task became all the harder at the corner she stopped abruptly and bade her good-bye i must leave you now mrs cameron i will call for you in the morning and help you secure the passes to enter the hospital the mother stroked the girl's hand and held it lingeringly how good you are she said softly and you have not told me your name elsie hesitated and said that's a little secret they call me sister elsie the banjo maid in the hospitals my father is a man of distinction i should be annoyed if my full name were known i'm elsie stoneman my father is the leader of the house i live with my aunt thank you she whispered pressing her hand elsie watched the dark figure disappear in the crowd with a strange tumult of feeling the mention of her father had revived the suspicion that he was the mysterious power threatening the policy of the president and planning a reign of terror for the south next to the president he was the most powerful man in washington and the unrelenting foe of mr lincoln although the leader of his party in congress which he ruled with a rod of iron he was a man of fierce and terrible resentments and yet in his personal life to those he knew he was generous and considerate old austin stoneman the great commoner he was called and his name was one to conjure with in the world of deeds to this fair girl he was the noblest roman of them all her ideal of greatness he was an indulgent father and while not demonstrative loved his children with passionate devotion she paused and looked up at the huge marble columns that seemed each a sentinel beckoning her to return within to the cot that held a wounded foe the twilight had deepened and the soft light of the rising moon had clothed the solemn majesty of the building with shimmering tenderness and beauty why should i be distressed for one an enemy among these thousands who have fallen she asked herself every detail of the scene she had passed through with him and his mother stood out in her soul with startling distinctness and the horror of his doom cut with the deep sense of personal anguish he shall not die she said with sudden resolution i'll take his mother to the president he can't resist her i'll send for phil to help me she hurried to the telegraph office and summoned her brother end of book one chapter one book one chapter two of the clansman 
an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry chapter two the great heart the next morning when elsie reached the obscure boarding house at which mrs cameron stopped the mother had gone to the market to buy a bunch of roses to place beside her boy's cot as elsie awaited her return the practical little yankee maid thought with a pang of the tenderness and folly of such people she knew this mother had scarcely enough to eat but to her bread was of small importance flowers necessary to life after all it was very sweet this foolishness of these southern people and it somehow made her homesick how can i tell her she sighed and yet i must she had only waited a moment when mrs cameron suddenly entered with her daughter she threw her flowers on the table sprang forward to meet elsie seized her hands and called to margaret how good of you to come so soon this margaret is our dear little friend who has been so good to ben and to me margaret took elsie's hand and longed to throw her arms around her neck but something in the quiet dignity of the northern girl's manner held her back she only smiled tenderly through her big dark eyes and softly said we love you ben was my last brother we were playmates and chums my heart broke when he ran away to the front how can we thank you and your brother i'm sure we've done nothing more than you would have done for us said elsie as mrs cameron left the room yes i know but we can never tell you how grateful we are to you we feel that you have saved ben's life and ours the war has been one long horror to us since my first brother was killed but now it's over and we have ben left and our hearts have been crying for joy all night i hoped my brother captain phil stoneman would be here today to meet you and help me but he can't reach washington before friday he caught ben in his arms cried margaret i know he's brave and you must be proud of him dr barnes says they are as much alike as twins only phil is not quite so tall and has blonde hair like mine you will let me see him and thank him the moment he comes hurry margaret cheerily cried mrs cameron re-entering the parlor get ready we must go at once to the hospital margaret turned and with stately grace hurried from the room the old dress she wore as unconscious of its shabbiness as though it were a royal robe and now my dear what must i do to get the passes asked the mother eagerly elsie's warm amber eyes grew misty for a moment and the fair skin with its gorgeous rose tints of the north paled she hesitated tried to speak and was silent the sensitive soul of the southern woman read the message of sorrow words had not framed tell me quickly the doctor has not concealed his true condition from me no he is certain to recover what then worse he is condemned to death by court-martial condemned to death a wounded prisoner of war she whispered slowly with blanched face yes he was accused of violating the rules of war as a guerrilla raider in the invasion of pennsylvania absurd and monstrous he was on general jeff stewart's staff and could have acted only under his orders he joined the infantry after stewart's death and rose to be a colonel though but a boy there's some terrible mistake unless we can obtain his pardon elsie went on in even restrained tones there is no hope we must appeal to the president the mother's lips trembled and she seemed about to faint could i see the president she asked recovering herself with an effort he has just reached washington from the front and is thronged by thousands it will be difficult the mother's lips were moving in silent prayer and her eyes were tightly closed to keep back the tears can you help me dear she asked piteously yes was the quick response you see she went on i feel so helpless i have never been to the white house or seen the president and i don't know how to go about seeing him or how to ask him and i am afraid of mr lincoln i have heard so many harsh things said of him i'll do my best mrs cameron we must go at once to the white house and try to see him 
the mother lifted the girl's hand and stroked it gently we will not tell margaret poor child she could not endure this when we return we may have better news it can't be worse i'll send her on an errand she took up the bouquet of gorgeous roses with a sigh buried her face in the fresh perfume as if to gain strength in their beauty and fragrance and left the room in a few moments she had returned and was on her way with elsie to the white house it was a beautiful spring morning this eleventh day of april eighteen sixty five the glorious sunshine the shimmering green of the grass the warm breezes and the shouts of victory mocked the mother's anguish at the white house gates they passed the blue sentry pacing silently back and forth who merely glanced at them with keen eyes and said nothing in the steady beat of his feet the mother could hear the tramp of soldiers leading her boy to the place of death a great lump rose in her throat as she caught the first view of the executive mansion gleaming white and silent and ghost-like among the budding trees the tall columns of the great facade spotless as snow the spray of the fountain the marble walls pure dazzling and cold seemed to her the gateway to some great tomb in which her own dead and the dead of all the people lay to her the fair white palace basking there in the sunlight and budding grass shrub and tree was the judgment house of fate she thought of all the weary feet that had climbed its fateful steps in hope to return in despair of its fierce dramas on which the lives of millions had hung and her heart grew sick a long line of people already stretched from the entrance under the portico far out across the park awaiting their turn to see the president mrs cameron placed her hand falteringly on elsie's shoulder look my dear what a crowd already must we wait in line no i can get you past the throng with my father's name will it be very difficult to reach the president no it's very easy guards and sentinels annoy him he frets until they are removed an assassin or maniac could kill him almost any hour of the day or night the doors are open at all hours very late at night i have often walked up to the rooms of his secretaries as late as nine o'clock without being challenged by a soul what must i call him must i say your excellency by no means he hates titles and forms you should say mr president in addressing him but you will please him best if in your sweet home-like way you will just call him by his name you can rely on his sympathy read this letter of his to a widow i brought it to show you she handed mrs cameron a newspaper clipping on which was printed mr lincoln's letter to mrs bixby of boston who had lost five sons in the war over and over she read its sentences until they echoed as solemn music in her soul Quote, i feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming but i cannot refrain from tendering you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the republic they died to save i pray that our heavenly father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom yours very sincerely and respectfully abraham lincoln and the president paused amid a thousand cares to write that letter to a broken-hearted woman the mother asked yes then he is good down to the last secret depths of a great heart only a christian father could have written that letter i shall not be afraid to speak to him and they told me he was an infidel elsie led her by a private way past the crowd and into the office of major hay the president's private secretary a word from the great commoner's daughter admitted them at once to the president's room just take a seat on one side miss elsie said major hay watch your first opportunity and introduce your friend on entering the room mrs cameron could not see the president who was seated at his desk surrounded by three men in deep consultation over a mass of official documents she looked about the room nervously and felt reassured by its plain aspect it was a medium-sized office-like place with no signs of elegance or ceremony 
mr lincoln was seated in an armchair beside a high writing desk and table combined she noticed that his feet were large and that they rested on a piece of simple straw matting around the room were sofas and chairs covered with green worsted when the group about the chair parted a moment she caught the first glimpse of the man who held her life in the hollow of his hand she studied him with breathless interest his back was still turned even while seated she saw that he was a man of enormous stature fully six feet four inches tall legs and arms abnormally long and huge broad shoulders slightly stooped his head was powerful and crowned with a mass of heavy brown hair tinged with silver he turned his head slightly and she saw his profile set in its short dark beard the broad intellectual brow half covered by unmanageable hair his face marked with deep-cut lines of life and death with great hollows in the cheeks and under the eyes in the lines which marked the corners of his mouth she could see firmness and his beetling brows and unusually heavy eyelids looked stern and formidable her heart sank she looked again and saw goodness tenderness sorrow canny shrewdness and a strange lurking smile all haunting his mouth and eye suddenly he threw himself forward in his chair wheeled and faced one of his tormentors with a curious and comical expression with one hand patting the other and a funny look overspreading his face he said my friend let me tell you something the man again stepped before him and she could hear nothing when the story was finished the man tried to laugh it died in a feeble effort but the president laughed heartily laughed all over and laughed his visitors out of the room mrs cameron turned toward elsie with a mute look of appeal to give her this moment a good humor in which to plead her cause but before she could move a man of military bearing suddenly stepped before the president he began to speak but seeing the look of stern decision in mr lincoln's face turned abruptly and said mr president i see you are fully determined not to do me justice mr lincoln slightly compressed his lips rose quietly seized the intruder by the arm and led him toward the door this is the third time you have forced your presence on me sir asking that i reverse the just sentence of court-martial dismissing you from the service i told you my decision was carefully made and was final now i give you fair warning never to show yourself in this room again i can bear censure but i will not endure insult in whining tones the man begged for the papers he had dropped be gone sir said the president as he thrust him through the door your papers will be sent to you the poor mother trembled at this startling act and sank back limp in her seat with quick swinging stride the president walked back to his desk accompanied by major hay and a young german girl whose simple dress told that she was from the western plains he handed the secretary an official paper give this pardon to the boy's mother when she comes this morning he said kindly to the secretary his eyes suddenly full of gentleness how could i consent to shoot a boy raised on a farm in the habit of going to bed at dark for falling asleep at his post when required to watch all night i'll never go into eternity with the blood of such a boy on my skirts again the mother's heart rose you remember the young man i pardoned for a similar offense in sixty two about which stanton made such a fuss he went on in softly reminiscent tones well here is that pardon he drew from the lining of his silk hat a photograph around which was wrapped an executive pardon through the lower end of it was a bullet hole stained with blood i got this in richmond they found him dead on the field he fell in the front ranks with my photograph in his pocket next to his heart this pardon wrapped around it and on the back of it in his boy's scrawl god bless abraham lincoln i love to invest in bonds like that the secretary returned to his room the girl who was waiting stepped forward and the president rose to receive her the mother's quick eye noted with surprise the simple dignity and chivalry of manner with which he received this humble woman of the people 
with straightforward eloquence the girl poured out her story begging for the pardon of her young brother who had been sentenced to death as a deserter he listened in silence how pathetic the deep melancholy of his sad face yes she was sure the saddest face that god ever made in all the world her own stricken heart for a moment went out to him in sympathy the president took off his spectacles wiped his forehead with the large red silk handkerchief he carried and his eyes twinkled kindly down into the good german face you seem an honest truthful sweet girl he said and he smiled you don't wear hoop skirts i may be whipped for this but i'll trust you and your brother too he shall be pardoned elsie rose to introduce mrs cameron when a congressman from massachusetts suddenly stepped before her and pressed for the pardon of a slave trader whose ship had been confiscated he had spent five years in prison but could not pay the heavy fine in money imposed the president had taken his seat again and read the eloquent appeal for mercy he looked up over his spectacles fixed his eyes piercingly on the congressman and said this is a moving appeal sir expressed with great eloquence i might pardon a murderer under the spell of such words but a man who can make a business of going to africa and robbing her of her helpless children and selling them into bondage no sir he may rot in jail before he shall have liberty by any act of mine again the mother's heart sank her hour had come she must put the issue of life or death to the test and as elsie rose and stepped quickly forward she followed nerving herself for the ordeal the president took elsie's hand familiarly and smiled without rising evidently she was well known to him will you hear the prayer of a broken-hearted mother of the south who has lost four sons in general lee's army she asked looking quietly past the girl he caught sight for the first time of the faded dress and the sorrow-shadowed face he was on his feet in a moment extending his hand and led her to a chair take this seat madam and then tell me in your own way what i can do for you in simple words mighty with the eloquence of a mother's heart she told her story and asked for the pardon of her boy promising his word of honor and her own that he would never again take up arms against the union the war is over now mr lincoln she said and we have lost all can you conceive the desolation of my heart my four boys were noble men they may have been wrong but they fought for what they believed was right you too have lost a boy the president's eyes grew dim yes a beautiful boy he said simply well mine are all gone but this baby one of them sleeps in an unmarked grave at gettysburg one died in a northern prison one fell at chancellorsville one in the wilderness and this my baby before petersburg perhaps i've loved him too much this last one he's only a child yet you shall have your boy my dear madam the president said simply seating himself and writing a brief order to the secretary of war the mother drew near his desk softly crying through her tears she said my heart is heavy mr lincoln when i think of all the hard and bitter things we have heard of you well give my love to the people of south carolina when you go home and tell them that i am their president and that i have never forgotten this fact in the darkest hours of this awful war and i am going to do everything in my power to help them you will never regret this generous act the mother cried with gratitude i reckon not he answered i'll tell you something madam if you won't tell anybody it's a secret of my administration i'm only too glad of an excuse to save a life when i can every drop of blood shed in this war north and south has been as if it were wrung out of my heart a strange fate decreed that the bloodiest war in human history should be fought under my direction and i to whom the sight of blood is a sickening horror i have been compelled to look on in silent anguish because i could not stop it 
now that the union is saved not another drop of blood shall be spilled if i can prevent it may god bless you the mother cried as she received from him the order she held his hand an instant as she took her leave laughing and sobbing in her great joy i must tell you mr president she said how surprised and how pleased i am to find you are a southern man why didn't you know that my parents were virginians and that i was born in kentucky very few people in the south know it i am ashamed to say i did not then how did you know i am a southerner by your looks your manner of speech your easy kindly ways your tenderness and humor your firmness in the right as you see it and above all the way you rose and bowed to a woman in an old faded black dress whom you knew to be an enemy no madam not an enemy now he said softly that word is out of date if we had only known you in time the president accompanied her to the door with a deference of manner that showed he had been deeply touched take this letter to mr stanton at once he said some folks complain of my pardons but it rests me after a hard day's work if i can save some poor boy's life i go to bed happy thinking of the joy i have given to those who love him as the last words were spoken a peculiar dreaminess of expression stole over his careworn face as if a throng of gracious memories had lifted for a moment the burden of his life End of Book One, Chapter Two. Book One, Chapter Three of The Klansman, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Three The Man of War elsie led mrs cameron direct from the white house to the war department well mrs cameron what did you think of the president she asked i hardly know was the thoughtful answer he is the greatest man i ever met one feels this instinctively when mrs cameron was ushered into the secretary's office mr stanton was seated at his desk writing she handed the order of the president to a clerk who gave it to the secretary he was a man in the full prime of life intellectual and physical low and heavy set about five feet eight inches in height and inclined to fat his movements however were quick and as he swung in his chair the keenest vigor marked every movement of body and every change of his countenance his face was swarthy and covered with a long dark beard touched with gray he turned a pair of little black piercing eyes on her and without rising said so you are the woman who has a wounded son under sentence of death as a gorilla i am so unfortunate she answered well i have nothing to say to you he went on in a louder and sterner tone and no time to waste on you if you have raised up men to rebel against the best government under the sun you can take the consequences but my dear sir broke in the mother he is a mere boy of nineteen who ran away three years ago and entered the service i don't want to hear another word from you he yelled in a rage i have no time to waste go at once i'll do nothing for you but i bring you an order from the president protested the mother yes i know it he answered with a sneer and i'll do with it what i've done with many others see that it is not executed now go but the president told me you would give me a pass to the hospital and that a full pardon would be issued to my boy yes i see but let me give you some information the president is a fool a damned fool now will you go with a sinking sense of horror mrs cameron withdrew and reported to elsie the unexpected encounter the brute cried the girl we'll go back immediately and report this insult to the president why are such men entrusted with power the mother sighed it's a mystery to me i'm sure they say he is the greatest secretary of war in our history i don't believe it phil hates the sight of him and so does every army officer i know from general grant down 
i hope mr lincoln will expel him from the cabinet for this insult when they were again ushered into the president's office elsie hastened to inform him of the outrageous reply the secretary of war had made to his order did stanton say that i was a fool he asked with a quizzical look out of his kindly eyes yes he did snapped elsie and he repeated it with a blankety prefix the president looked good-humoredly out of the window toward the war office and musingly said well if stanton says that i'm a blankety fool it must be so for i have found out that he is nearly always right and generally means what he says i'll just step over and see stanton as he spoke the last sentence the humor slowly faded from his face and the anxious mother saw back of those patient gray eyes the sudden gleam of the courage and conscious power of a lion he dismissed them with instructions to return the next day for his final orders and walked over to the war department alone the secretary of war was in one of his ugliest moods and made no effort to conceal it when asked his reasons for the refusal to execute the order the grounds for my action are very simple he said with bitter emphasis the execution of this traitor is part of a carefully considered policy of justice on which the future security of the nation depends if i am to administer this office i will not be hamstrung by constant executive interference besides in this particular case i was urged that justice be promptly executed by the most powerful man in congress i advise you to avoid a quarrel with old stoneman at this crisis in our history the president sat on a sofa with his legs crossed relapsed into an attitude of resignation and listened in silence until the last sentence when suddenly he sat bolt upright fixed his deep gray eyes intently on stanton and said mr secretary i reckon you will have to execute that order i cannot do it came the firm answer it is an interference with justice and i will not execute it mr lincoln held his eyes steadily on stanton and slowly said mr secretary it will have to be done stanton wheeled in his chair seized a pen and wrote very rapidly a few lines to which he fixed his signature he rose with the paper in his hand walked to his chief and with deep emotion said mr president i wish to thank you for your constant friendship during the trying years i have held this office the war is ended and my work is done i hand you my resignation mr lincoln's lips came suddenly together he slowly rose and looked down with surprise into the flushed angry face he took the paper tore it into pieces slipped one of his long arms around the secretary and said in low accents stanton you have been a faithful public servant and it is not for you to say when you will no longer be needed go on with your work i will have my way in this matter but i will attend to it personally stanton resumed his seat and the president returned to the white house End of Book One, Chapter Three. Book One, Chapter Four of The Klansman, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Four A Clash of Giants. Elsie secured from the Surgeon General temporary passes for the day and sent her friends to the hospital with the promise that she would not leave the White House until she had secured the pardon. The President greeted her with unusual warmth, the smile that had only haunted his sad face during four years of struggle, defeat, and uncertainty had now burst into joy that made his powerful head radiate light. Victory had lifted the veil from his soul, and he was girding himself for the task of healing the nation's wounds. "'I'll have it ready for you in a moment, Miss Elsie,' he said, touching with his sinewy hand a paper which lay on his desk, bearing on its face the red seal of the Republic. "'I am only waiting to receive the passes.' "'I am very grateful to you, Mr. President,' the girl said feelingly. "'But tell me.' he said with quaint fatherly humor 
why you of all our girls the brightest fiercest little yankee in town so take to heart a rebel boy's sorrows elsie blushed and then looked at him frankly with a saucy smile i'm fulfilling the commandments love your enemies certainly how could one help loving the sweet motherly face you saw yesterday the president laughed heartily i see of course of course the honorable austin stoneman suddenly announced a clerk at his elbow elsie started in surprise and whispered don't let my father know i am here i will wait in the next room you'll let nothing delay the pardon will you mr president mr lincoln warmly pressed her hand as she disappeared through the door leading into major hay's room and turned to meet the great commoner who hobbled slowly in leaning on his crooked cane at this moment he was a startling and portentous figure in the drama of the nation the most powerful parliamentary leader in american history not excepting henry clay no stranger ever passed this man without a second look his clean-shaven face the massive chiseled features his grim eagle look and cold colorless eyes with the frosts of his native vermont sparkling in their depths compelled attention his walk was a painful hobble he was lame in both feet and one of them was deformed the left leg ended in a mere bunch of flesh resembling more closely an elephant's hoof than the foot of a man he was absolutely bald and wore a heavy brown wig that seemed too small to reach the edge of his enormous forehead he rarely visited the white house he was the able bold unscrupulous leader of leaders and men came to see him he rarely smiled and when he did it was the smile of the cynic and misanthrope his tongue had the lash of a scorpion he was a greater terror to the trimmers and time servers of his own party than to his political foes he had hated the president with sullen consistent and unyielding venom from his first nomination at chicago down to the last rumor of his new proclamation in temperament a fanatic in impulse a born revolutionist the word conservatism was to him as a red rag to a bull the first clash of arms was music to his soul he laughed at the call for seventy-five thousand volunteers and demanded the immediate equipment of an army of a million men he saw it grow to two million from the first his eagle eye had seen the end and all the long blood-marked way between and from the first he began to plot the most cruel and awful vengeance in human history and now his time had come the giant figure in the white house alone had dared to brook his anger and block the way for old stoneman was the congress of the united states the opposition was too weak even for his contempt cool deliberate and venomous alike in victory or defeat the fascination of his positive faith and revolutionary program had drawn the rank and file of his party in congress to him as charmed satellites the president greeted him cordially and with his habitual deference to age and physical infirmity hastened to place for him an easy chair near his desk he was breathing heavily and evidently laboring under great emotion he brought his cane to the floor with violence placed both hands on its crook leaned his massive jaws on his hands for a moment and then said mr president i have not annoyed you with many requests during the past four years nor am i here today to ask any favors i have come to warn you that in the course you have mapped out the executive and legislative branches have come to the parting of the ways and that your encroachments on the functions of congress will be tolerated now that the rebellion is crushed not for a single moment mr lincoln listened with dignity and a ripple of fun played about his eyes as he looked at his grim visitor the two men were face to face at last the two men above all others who had built and were to build the foundations of the new nation lincoln's in love and wisdom to endure forever the great commoners in hate and madness to bear its harvest of tragedy and death for generations yet unborn well now stoneman 
began the good-humored voice that puts me in mind the old commoner lifted his hand with a gesture of angry impatience save your fables for fools is it true that you have prepared a proclamation restoring the conquered province of north carolina to its place as a state in the union with no provision for negro suffrage or the exile and disenfranchisement of its rebels the president rose and walked back and forth with his hands folded behind him before answering i have the constitution grants to the national government no power to regulate suffrage and makes no provision for the control of conquered provinces constitution thundered stoneman i have a hundred constitutions in the pigeonholes of my desk i have sworn to support but one a worn-out rag rag or silk i've sworn to execute it and i'll do it so help me god said the quiet voice you've been doing it for the past four years haven't you sneered the commoner what right had you under the constitution to declare war against a sovereign state to invade one for coercion to blockade a port to declare slaves free to suspend the writ of habeas corpus to create the state of west virginia by the consent of two states one of which was dead and the other one of which lived in ohio by what authority have you appointed military governors in the sovereign states of virginia tennessee and louisiana why trim the hedge and lie about it we too are revolutionists and you are our executive the constitution sustained and protected slavery it was a league with death and a covenant with hell and our flag a polluted rag in the stress of war said the president with a faraway look it was necessary that i do things as commander-in-chief of the army and navy to save the union which i have no right to do now that the union is saved and its constitution preserved my first duty is to re-establish the constitution as our supreme law over every inch of our soil the constitution be damned hissed the old man it was the creation both in letter and spirit of the slaveholders of the south then the world is their debtor and their work is a monument of imperishable glory to them and to their children i have sworn to preserve it we have outgrown the swaddling clothes of a babe we will make new constitutions fools rush in where angels fear to tread softly spoke the tall self-contained man for the first time the old leader winced he had long ago exhausted the vocabulary of contempt on the president his character ability and policy he felt as a shock the first impression of supreme authority with which he spoke the man he had despised had grown into the great constructive statesman who would dispute with him every inch of ground in the attainment of his sinister life purpose his hatred grew more intense as he realized the prestige and power with which he was clothed by his mighty office with an effort he restrained his anger and assumed an argumentative tone can't you see that your so-called states are now but conquered provinces that north carolina and other waste territories of the united states are unfit to associate with civilized communities we fought no war of conquest quietly urged the president but one of self-preservation as an indissoluble union no state ever got out of it by the grace of god and the power of our arms now that we have won and established for all time its unity shall we stultify ourselves by declaring we were wrong these states must be immediately restored to their rights or we shall betray the blood we have shed there are no conquered provinces for us to spoil a nation cannot make a conquest of its own territory but we're acting outside the constitution interrupted stoneman congress has no existence outside the constitution was the quick answer the old commoner scowled and his beetling brows hid for a moment his eyes his keen intellect was catching its first glimpse of the intellectual grandeur of the man with whom he was grappling 
the facility with which he could see all sides of a question and the vivid imagination which lit his mental processes were a revelation we always underestimate the men we despise why not out with it cried stoneman suddenly changing his tack you are determined to oppose negro suffrage i have suggested to governor hahn of louisiana to consider the policy of admitting the more intelligent and those who served in the war it is only a suggestion the state alone has the power to confer the ballot but the truth is this little suggestion of yours is only a bone thrown to radical dogs to satisfy our howlings for the moment in your soul of souls you don't believe in the equality of man if the man under comparison be a negro i believe there is a physical difference between the white and black races which will forever forbid their living together on terms of political and social equality if such be attempted one must go to the wall very well pin the southern white man to the wall our party and the nation will then be safe that is to say destroy african slavery and establish white slavery under negro masters that would be progress with a vengeance a grim smile twitched the old man's lips as he said yes your prim conservative snobs and male waiting maids in congress went into hysterics when i armed the negroes yet the heavens have not fallen true yet no more insane blunder could now be made than any further attempt to use these negro troops there can be no such thing as restoring this union to its basis of fraternal peace with armed negroes wearing the uniform of this nation tramping over the south and rousing the basest passions of the freedmen and their former masters general butler their old commander is now making plans for their removal at my request he expects to dig the panama canal with these black troops fine scheme that on a par with your messages to congress asking for the colonization of the whole negro race it will come to that ultimately said the president firmly the negro has cost us five billion dollars the desolation of ten great states and rivers of blood we can well afford a few million dollars more to effect a permanent settlement of the issue this is the only policy on which seward and i have differed then seward was not an utterly hopeless fool i am glad to hear something to his credit growled the old commoner i have urged the colonization of the negroes and i shall continue until it is accomplished my emancipation proclamation was linked with this plan thousands of them have lived in the north for a hundred years yet not one is the pastor of a white church a judge a governor a mayor or a college president there is no room for two distinct races of white men in america much less for two distinct races of whites and blacks we can have no inferior servile class peon or peasant we must assimilate or expel the american is a citizen king or nothing i can conceive of no greater calamity than the assimilation of the negro into our social and political life as our equal a mulatto citizenship would be too dear a price to pay even for emancipation words have no power to express my loathing for such twaddle cried stoneman snapping his great jaws together and pursing his lips with contempt if the negro were not here would we allow him to land the president went on as if talking to himself the duty to exclude carries the right to expel within twenty years we can peacefully colonize the negro in the tropics and give him our language literature religion and system of government under conditions in which he can rise to the full measure of manhood this he can never do here it was the fear of the black tragedy behind emancipation that led the south into the insanity of secession 
we can never attain the ideal union our fathers dreamed with millions of an alien inferior race among us whose assimilation is neither possible nor desirable the nation cannot now exist half white and half black any more than it could exist half slave and half free yet god hath made of one blood all races quoted the cynic with a sneer yes but finish the sentence and fixed the bonds of their habitation god never meant that the negro should leave his habitat or the white man invade his home our violation of this law is written in two centuries of shame and blood and the tragedy will not be closed until the black man is restored to his home i marvel that the minions of slavery elected jeff davis their chief with so much better material at hand his election was a tragic and superfluous blunder i am the president of the united states north and south was the firm reply particularly the south hissed stoneman during all this hideous war they have been your pets these rebel savages who have been murdering our sons you have been the ever ready champion of traitors and now you dare to bend this high office to their defense my god stoneman are you a man or a savage cried the president is not the north equally responsible for slavery has not the south lost all have not the southern people paid the full penalty of all the crimes of war are our skirts free was sherman's march a picnic this war has been a giant conflict of principles to decide whether we are a bundle of petty sovereignties held by a rope of sand or a mighty nation of freemen but for the loyalty of four border southern states but for farragut and thomas and their two hundred thousand heroic southern brethren who fought for the union against their own flesh and blood we should have lost you cannot indict a people i do indict them muttered the old man surely went on the even throbbing voice surely the vastness of this war its titanic battles its heroism its sublime earnestness should sink into oblivion all low schemes of vengeance before the sheer grandeur of its history our children will walk with silent lips and uncovered heads and forget the prison pen at andersonville yes we refused as a policy of war to exchange those prisoners blockaded their ports made medicine contraband and brought the southern army itself to starvation the prison records when made at last for history will show as many deaths on our side as on theirs the murderer on the gallows always wins more sympathy than his forgotten victim interrupted the cynic the sin of vengeance is an easy one under the subtle plea of justice said the sorrowful voice have we not had enough bloodshed is not god's vengeance enough when sherman's army swept to the sea before him lay the garden of eden behind him stretched a desert a hundred years cannot give back to the wasted south her wealth or two hundred years restore to her the lost seed treasures of her young manhood the imbecility of a policy of mercy in this crisis can only mean the reign of treason and violence persisted the old man ignoring the president's words i leave my policy before the judgment bar of time content with its verdict in my place radicalism would have driven the border states into the confederacy every southern man back to his kinsmen and divided the north itself into civil conflict i have sought to guide and control public opinion into the ways on which depended our life this rational flexibility of policy you and your fellow radicals have been pleased to call my vacillating imbecility and what is your message for the south simply this abolish slavery come back home and behave yourself lee surrendered to our offers of peace and amnesty 
in my last message to congress i told the southern people they could have peace at any moment by simply laying down their arms and submitting to national authority now that they have taken me at my word shall i betray them by an ignoble revenge vengeance cannot heal and purify it can only brutalize and destroy stoneman shuffled to his feet with impatience i see it is useless to argue with you i'll not waste my breath i give you an ultimatum the south is conquered soil i mean to blot it from the map rather than admit one traitor to the halls of congress from these so-called states i will shatter the union itself into ten thousand fragments i will not sit beside men whose clothes smell of the blood of my kindred at least dry them before they come in four years ago with yells and curses these traitors left the halls of congress to join the armies of cataline shall they return to rule i repeat said the president you cannot indict a people treason is an easy word to speak a traitor is one who fights and loses washington was a traitor to george the third treason won and washington is immortal treason is a word that victors hurl at those who fail listen to me stoneman interrupted with vehemence the life of our party demands that the negro be given the ballot and made the ruler of the south this can be done only by the extermination of its landed aristocracy that their mothers shall not breed another race of traitors this is not vengeance it is justice it is patriotism it is the highest wisdom and humanity nature at times blots out whole communities and races that obstruct progress such is the political genius of these people that unless you make the negro the ruler the south will yet reconquer the north and undo the work of this war if the south in poverty and ruin can do this we deserve to be ruled the north is rich and powerful the south a land of wreck and tomb i greet with wonder shame and scorn such ignoble fear the nation cannot be healed until the south is healed let the gulf be closed in which we bury slavery sectional animosity and all strifes and hatreds the good sense of our people will never consent to your scheme of insane vengeance the people have no sense a new fool is born every second they are ruled by impulse and passion i have trusted them before and they have not failed me the day i left for gettysburg to dedicate the battlefield you were so sure of my defeat in the approaching convention that you shouted across the street to a friend as i passed quote, let the dead bury their dead End quote. it was a brilliant sally of wit i laughed at it myself and yet the people unanimously called me again to lead them to victory yes in the past said stoneman bitterly you have triumphed but mark my word from this hour your star grows dim the slumbering fires of passion will be kindled in the fight we join today i'll break your back and wring the neck of every dastard and time server who fawns at your feet the president broke into a laugh that only increased the old man's wrath i protest against the insult of your buffoonery excuse me stoneman i have to laugh or die beneath the burdens i bear surrounded by such supporters mark my word growled the old leader from the moment you publish that north carolina proclamation your name will be a byword in congress there are higher powers you will need them i'll have help was the calm reply as the dreaminess of the poet and mystic stole over the rugged face i would be a presumptuous fool indeed if i thought that for a day i could discharge the duties of this great office without the aid of one who is wiser and stronger than all others you'll need the help of almighty god in the course you've mapped out some ships come into port that are not steered went on the dreamy voice suppose pickett had charged one hour earlier at gettysburg suppose the monitor had arrived one hour later at hampton roads i had a dream last night that always presages great events 
i saw a white ship passing swiftly under full sail i have often seen her before i have never known her port of entry or her destination but i have always known her pilot the cynic's lips curled with scorn he leaned heavily on his cane and took a shambling step toward the door you refuse to heed the wishes of congress if your words voice them yes force your scheme of revenge on the south and you will sow the wind and reap the whirlwind indeed and from what secret cave will this whirlwind come the despair of a mighty race of world-conquering men even in defeat is still a force that statesmen reckon with i defy them growled the old commoner again the dreamy look returned to lincoln's face and he spoke as if repeating a message of the soul caught in the clouds in an hour of transfiguration and i'll trust the honor of lee and his people the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when touched again as they surely will be by the better angels of our nature you'll be lucky to live to hear that chorus to dream it is enough if i fall by the hand of an assassin now he will not come from the south i was safer in richmond this week than i am in washington today the cynic grunted and shuffled another step toward the door the president came closer look here stoneman have you some deep personal motive in this vengeance on the south come now i've never in my life known you to tell a lie the answer was silence and a scowl am i right yes and no i hate the south because i hate the satanic institution of slavery with consuming fury it has long ago rotted the heart out of the southern people humanity cannot live in its tainted air and its children are doomed if my personal wrongs have ordained me for a mighty task no matter i am simply the chosen instrument of justice again the mystic light clothed the rugged face calm and patient as destiny as the president slowly repeated with malice toward none with charity for all with firmness in the right as god gives me to see the right i shall strive to finish the work we are in and bind up the nation's wounds i've given you fair warning cried the commoner trembling with rage as he hobbled nearer the door from this hour your administration is doomed stoneman said the kindly voice i can't tell you how your venomous philanthropy sickens me you have misunderstood and abused me at every step during the past four years i bear you no ill will if i have said anything today to hurt your feelings forgive me the earnestness with which you pressed the war was an invaluable service to me and to the nation i'd rather work with you than fight you but now that we have to fight i'd as well tell you i'm not afraid of you i'll suffer my right arm to be severed from my body before i'll sign one measure of ignoble revenge on a brave fallen foe and i'll keep up this fight until i win die or my country forsakes me i have always known you had a sneaking admiration for the south came the sullen sneer i love the south it is a part of this union i love every foot of its soil every hill and valley mountain lake and sea and every man woman and child that breathes beneath its skies i am an american as the burning words leaped from the heart of the president the broad shoulders of his tall form lifted and his massive head rose in unconscious heroic pose i marvel that you ever made war upon your loved ones cried the cynic we fought the south because we loved her and would not let her go now that she is crushed and lies bleeding at our feet you shall not make war on the wounded dying and the dead again the lion gleamed in the calm gray eyes end of book one chapter four
book one chapter five of the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry chapter five the battle of love Elsie carried Ben Cameron's pardon to the anxious mother and sister with her mind in a tumult. The name on these fateful papers fascinated her. She read it again and again with a curious personal joy that she had saved a life. She had entered on her work among the hospitals, a bitter partisan of her father's school, with the simple idea that all Southerners were savage brutes yet as she had seen the wounded boys from the south among the men in blue more and more she had forgotten the difference between them they were so young these slender dark-haired ones from dixie so pitifully young some of them were only fifteen and hundreds not over sixteen a lad of fourteen she had kissed one day in sheer agony of pity for his loneliness the part her father was playing in the drama on which ben cameron's life had hung puzzled her was his the mysterious arm back of stanton echoes of the fierce struggle with the president had floated through the half-open door she had implicit faith in her father's patriotism and pride in his giant intellect she knew that he was a king among men by divine right of inherent power his sensitive spirit brooding over a pitiful lameness had hidden from the world behind a frowning brow like a wounded animal yet her hand in hours of love when no eye save god's could see had led his great soul out of its dark lair she loved him with brooding tenderness knowing that she had gotten closer to his inner life than any other human being closer than her own mother who had died while she was a babe her aunt with whom she and phil now lived had told her the mother's life was not a happy one their natures had not proved congenial and her gentle quaker spirit had died of grief in the quiet home in southern pennsylvania yet there were times when he was a stranger even to her some secret dark and cold stood between them once she had tenderly asked him what it meant he merely pressed her hand smiled wearily and said nothing my dear only the blue devils after me again he had always lived in washington in a little house with black shutters near the capitol while the children had lived with his sister near the white house where they had grown from babyhood a curious fact about this place on the capitol hill was that his housekeeper lydia brown was a mulatto a woman of extraordinary animal beauty and the fiery temper of a leopardess elsie had ventured there once and gotten such a welcome she would never return all sorts of gossip could be heard in washington about this woman her jewels her dresses her airs her assumption of the dignity of the presiding genius of national legislation and her domination of the old commoner and his life it gradually crept into the newspapers and magazines but he never once condescended to notice it Elsie begged her father to close this house and live with them. His reply was short and emphatic. Impossible, my child. This club foot must live next door to the Capitol. My house is simply an executive office at which I sleep. Half the business of the nation is transacted there. Don't mention this subject again. Elsie choked back a sob at the cold menace in the tones of this command, and never repeated her request. It was the only wish he had ever denied her, and somehow her heart would come back to it with persistence and brood and wonder over his motive. The nearer she drew this morning to the hospital door, the closer the wounded boy's life and loved ones seemed to hers. She thought with anguish of the storm about to break between her father and the president, the one demanding the desolation of their land, wasted, harried, and unarmed, the president firm in his policy of mercy, generosity, and healing her father would not mince words his scorpion tongue set on fires of hell might start a conflagration that would light the nation with its glare would not his name be a terror for every man and woman born under southern skies the sickening feeling stole over her that he was wrong and his policy cruel and unjust 
she had never before admired the president it was fashionable to speak with contempt of him in washington he had little following in congress nine-tenths of the politicians hated or feared him and she knew her father had been the soul of a conspiracy at the capitol to prevent his second nomination and create a dictatorship under which to carry out an iron policy of reconstruction in the south and now she found herself heart and soul the champion of the president she was ashamed of her disloyalty and felt a rush of impetuous anger against ben and his people for thrusting themselves between her and her own yet how absurd to feel thus against the innocent victims of a great tragedy she put the thought from her still she must part from them now before the brewing storm burst it would be best for her and best for them this pardon delivered would end their relations she would send the papers by a messenger and not see them again and then she thought with a throb of girlish pride of the hour to come in the future when ben's big brown eyes would be softened with a tear when he would learn that she had saved his life they had concealed all from him as yet she was afraid to question too closely in her own heart the shadowy motive that lay back of her joy she read again with a lingering smile the name ben cameron on the paper with its big red seal of life she had laughed at boys who had made love to her dreaming a wider nobler life of heroic service and she felt that she was fulfilling her ideal in the generous hand she had extended to these who were friendless were they not the children of her soul in that larger finer world of which she had dreamed and sung why should she give them up now for brutal politics their sorrow had been hers their joy should be hers too she would take the papers herself and then say good-bye she found the mother and sister beside the cot ben was sleeping with margaret holding one of his hands the mother was busy sewing for the wounded confederate boys she had found scattered through the hospital at the sight of elsie holding aloft the message of life she sprang to meet her with a cry of joy she clasped the girl to her breast unable to speak at last she released her and said with a sob my child through good report and through evil report my love will enfold you elsie stammered looked away and tried to hide her emotion margaret had knelt and bowed her head on ben's cot she rose at length threw her arms around elsie in a resistless impulse kissed her and whispered my sweet sister elsie's heart leaped at the words as her eyes rested on the face of the sleeping soldier End of book one chapter five